So I've been fascinated ever since we interviewed Richard Tarnas and I saw on Richard Tarnas's book a quote from you mm -hmm. and then also realised after we interviewed Ian McGilchrist that you were friends with him also. Mm. Uh, and I'm really interested in what it is that you, that you find compelling about, about their thought. Uh, they're talking about the things that I find most interesting and most important which are a long way from what most people are interested <laughs> in uh, because I've always been interested in stuff to do with psychology of almost every kind and I'm also interested in spiritual stuff in a very weakened form um, which is what I, what I call um, why we're here is there a purpose of life? And of course, the current scientific uh, paradigm says there's no purpose at all. Uh, consciousness is an epiphenomenon caused by chemical, <laughs> sorry, chemical reaction, which I think is complete nonsense. It reminds me of what George Orwell once said, which was only an intellectual could believe that. Richard Tarnas in particular, I read Passion of the Western Mind at mm. university and I think it had m more impact on me than anything else I've ever read. You were in, interested in Richard's work before Ian's or wh what was well, the sequence? I read uh, Passion of the Western World before I met uh, Richard Tarnas and uh, the moment we met um, and that was at Esalen, uh, we just clicked and uh, I love being around people who are much, much cleverer and wiser than I am. <laughs> and what is it about his work, and obviously having spent time with well, him as well, that you find interesting? The point about uh, Richard, and you would never find this, I think, in the UK, is that he teaches at a place called CIS, the California Institute of Integral Studies, in which he's dealing with almost everything that's really important and uh, looking at all the influences on us that are normally ignored by modern science. I meet these people whenever I can stop working and have a bit of time off because they're talking about what I think really matters and a lot of it would be regarded as very strange by the bourgeois. I mean, if I sat at a dinner table in London and started talking about the afterlife, which I believe through these people that there's ample evidence that something goes on, the table would go quiet because they would be embarrassed that I'd gone off my rocker. And I think that this is an indication of just how crazy the intellectual world, I won't say has become, because it may always have been like this, but how crazy the intellectual world is. I mean, for 60 years, uh, we learn that fats were the cause of heart disease, and suddenly we discover, oh no, they're not, it's, it's sugar. Well, 60 years, you know, in behaviorism, which is simply uh, observing what you can observe and then pretending everything else doesn't exist, which is insane in itself, you know, that dominated psychology for 60 years. And what annoys me about science is not that they make a lot of mistakes, but they are so resistant to changing their mistakes. And I think it's because nobody likes to change paradigms if their previous work was dependent on the paradigm because it devalues their work if somebody suddenly says, well, the theory you based it on isn't quite right. So, I mean, there's a lot of people talking about the need for a paradigm shift. And I guess Richard Tarnas and Ian McGilchrist are both involved in whatever that might look like. You've obviously been interested in this for a while. What do you make of, what, what is the paradigm shift that's needed, do you think? Well, it's to move away from the idea that this is a reductionist, materialist universe, which a lot of obviously very clever people like uh, Dawkins and, and, and uh, uh, Stephen Pinker are, are absolutely dead set on. And I think it's, from what I know, and after all, these aren't my ideas, I just hear other people's ideas, and I think I can spot good ones. This is a ridiculous and that the evidence that disproves it just gets pushed out of the way. I mean, uh, Rupert Sheldrake, whom I admire greatly, was on television, BBC, of course, Science Department, which is a very uh, primitive sort of productionist, reductionist uh, department, went on with, with Dawkins. And um, when Dawkins became very dismissive, I mean, Sheldrake asked him 
about the stuff that Sheldrake had sent him to read. And, and, and uh, Dawkins said, I didn't bother to read it because I know this nonsense. Which is like Galileo saying, you know, when he'd invented the telescope and he invites the top people from the Catholic Church. And he says, please come and look through my beautiful new telescope and see the craters on the moon. And the scholastics say, Galileo, we don't need to look through your telescope. We know they're not there. Now, we laugh at them, medieval church. And we have a lot of similar feelings in today's science. And Ian McGilchrist's work talks about the left brain and the right brain as different ways of looking at the world. The left brain, very atomistic, reductionist, and the right brain, much more open to nuance and uh, the mystery. Mm. What, why do you think that's a really significant perspective? Because I don't think that the world is a very happy place. And uh, Ian's point really is that the left brain likes to dominate, or left hemisphere likes to dominate the right hemisphere. And it seems to have the weapons because it, it's very, um, you know, it has speech on its side. Uh, it's very strong in speech. The left brain wants to control and exploit and produce and analyze and divide in order to find out more about it, whereas the right brain sees the whole thing and it's in the right hemisphere that we get our feelings of meaningfulness in life, which I think is why so many of the philosophers are rather depressed because they're in the left brain and of course that's the stuff they write because if you're happy you write happy things and have happy thoughts and if you're sad you write sad things because you have sad thoughts. So uh, until we get the re, 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 sort of re get, regain the balance that I think we had, but Ian thinks that goes back as far as the Enlightenment, which was a moment when people sort of said, get rid of the right hemisphere way of, of relating to it, make everything very analytic in the sort of Darwinian sense that 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 the. the, 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 the uh, um, uh, universe can only be uh, understood as a piece of clockwork. And do you think there's a, a connection to comedy there? The right and the um, left brain? Yes, I, I, I do. I think that uh, people who are very, very analytical tend not to have very good senses of comedy. Or if they do, it'll be a very narrow kind of comedy, a sort of wit comedy. Whereas the part of us that, that uh, loves absurd situations like Faulty Towers, if, you, if, you, if you're too stuck in your left hemisphere, you won't think of that uh, as funny. You'll just think, what an idiot. And both um, Richard and Ian are considered sort of spiritual, looking at the spiritual world. How would you describe your kind of religious or spiritual orientation? Well, I think, again, that there's lots going on that modern science denies, but I think the great sadness is that uh, you start with a religious leader and you finish up with an organised church, and any kind of religion that I think is worthwhile is to do with trying to break down the power of our egos. And if you look at the Beatitudes, which is the heart of Christ's teaching, when he says, blessed are the meek, blessed are the... Uh, peacemakers? Uh, peacemakers. Or I cheesemakers, one of the two. It's, uh, hang on. When, when, when Jesus is in the Beatitudes, he says, uh, blessed are the pure in heart, you know, yeah. blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, blessed are the peacemakers. This is about people who are not running around sticking their chests out and saying how important they are. Mm. It's about a quietness. Do you see what I mean? And a, a receptiveness, which means that maybe some kind of divine, uh, divine experience can come through if you get in that mood, which is why so many of the more interesting religions emphasize meditation. Do you see what I mean? Yes. But the moment that people come along uh, they, and they say, not to Christ, but to people like Christ, well, well you've got to get uh, organized here, you know, we need a marketing department. And what you finish up with is the Catholic Church, which is supposed to be teaching, Christ's teaching, which is humility, poverty, and uh, tolerance. And of course, it's a very rich, powerful, authoritarian organization. Now, this is the ultimate paradox, is the politest word. Um, and that's the problem with organized religion, whereas I think the, there are people sometimes who have insights into what religion is really about, but I don't think they're very good at organizing, except for the Buddhists who insist on personal transmission. 
so that it's not lost because people read books and misunderstand them because they're at a low level of spiritual development. And I understand you've met the Dalai Lama? Yes. How was that? It was wonderful. I was, I was asked if I wanted to meet him and I said, well, of course, and I went up and I thought, well, I'll try not to say anything too banal, like, you know, where did you get your sandals or how is this particular reincarnation going? So I stood there waiting for the spirit to move me and uh, I just started laughing and he started laughing and we stood there laughing together for about 15 seconds and then I said, thank you very much, <laughs> and we moved off. And there's something about being around that man and those incarnate lamas that you suddenly become less egotistic or you suddenly become less worried about making a fool of yourself, less worried about um, letting something slip which will embarrass you and you become much more relaxed. Mm. And we've had a lot of people on our channel talk about what we're calling the, the, the meaning crisis, the crisis of meaning or the God-shaped hole in the culture. Do you think that that's underneath a lot of a lot of what with a lot of the conflict and division that we're seeing? Yes, I think there was a time when people had some sort of feeling that their lives were meaningful, and I think that uh, intellectuals then came along, and uh, you know the existentialists and so forth, and so it's a meaningless universe, and you know you might as well just do anything because you know at least it's authentic for you, and I don't think happiness lies that way. And I think if, if people just sat and meditated for 10 minutes a day, uh, I think the country would become much happier in about four days. People have forgotten what's important, eh? And money has become all important, particularly, sadly, in England now, in the way that it used to be in America, but it's now like that in England. With that kind of mindset, I don't think we can expect much to happen, but you never know. I mean, I remember I was with two family therapists once and they, they said very kindly about a couple they'd been seeing, I think they, one of them said, I think that what this couple needs is a nice crisis because people only change in crisis. So maybe there will be a crisis here, but I think if people actually started to think what might make me happy in other, other than uh, not what might make me richer or more important, I think people would become much happier almost straight away. Are you familiar at all with Jordan Peterson? I know that Jordan Peterson has fallen foul of the PC crowd, which means he must be a good chap. Because Ian McGilchrist had a really interesting conversation with Jordan Peterson mm. um, that, that was sort of this incredible exploratory conversation about mm. religious truth and the structure of the mind and the brain. Um, but you have to remember now that religion is just a bad thing um, and things are either good or bad and we have this kind of binary thing, feeling now that somebody's good or bad, which is of course nothing to do with real life. As my mother used to say, unless you keep an error, she would say there's good and bad in all of us. And this idea that certain things are good and certain things are bad, if you take someone like uh, colonial, uh, uh, the idea of colonialism, uh, uh, yes, all right, it's largely bad, but there were also good things. And people would get very angry with that remark, say, no, no, it was all bad at all times. And then that's associated with white-skinned people. You say, well, look, the Muslims have done quite a lot of colonialism. Was that in any way better than the white-skinned colonialism? You see what I mean? We're all much more mixed up. They just stop trying to pretend one thing is all good and one thing is all bad, because that's the definition of paranoia. And then you get into denial and projection, where the things that you deny in yourself, you project into other people and see in them. And then there's absolutely no chance of compromise, which the English the historians used to say, the English had, a, had a, a genius for compromise, not anymore. Have you ever been on the receiving end of any of this um, PC police? Oh uh, yeah, eight years ago I said that London wasn't uh, an English city anymore, which is immediately taken as a racialist remark. I mean, I'm all in favour of people uh, staying with their cultures. If they come to England, you know, they should bring their Caribbean culture with them or whatever, of course they would. But they should also be interested in the, in the culture of the country to which they come. It's an old fashioned thing, but it's when in Rome, do as the Romans. I mean, if I was going to live in another country, the first thing I'd do is learn the language and then I would find out a bit about the history and, 
maybe a little bit about the literature, but what I see is the English culture just fading away because nobody bothers to uh, promote it at all. But everyone else's culture is more important. No, they're all important. And I also don't think that all cultures are equal. For example, a culture that actually turns a blind eye or even tolerates female genital mutilation is not as good as a culture that doesn't. But that will make people go, well, who are you to say? Well, I said, well, well just so, so that's my opinion. Because there was some press coverage accusing you of racism for that. Yes, yeah, so there's a difference between racism and culturalism. Uh, that is, if you're of a particular race, there's not much you can do about it. But so far as culture is concerned, you can choose exactly which culture or which cultures you like. So you have freedom to choose with culture, and that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about colour. I mean, most of the tr most of the trouble in London at the moment is that the nice houses in the centre of London have been brought up by uh, um, Ukrainian oligarchs who paid 40 million and spent another 20 million on it, and it's for their auntie or their mother-in-law who then comes to London four weeks in the year and leaves the place empty for 48 weeks in the year. If you walk around Belgravia, it's absolutely deserted. Well, is that a good thing? I don't want to have any Ukrainians here, but I don't want them dominating the culture. I don't really want Saudi princes sort of racing up and down Sloan Street at the small hours of the morning. I mean, that's not English. And also, we have a lot of knife crime now. Well, I would say I don't remember that 40 years ago. It was that people didn't use knives in those days. So there's a lot of changes taking place. And in some ways, I prefer the old England, which I think was more tolerant and more humorous and more relaxed and took things a little bit more easily. You know, the, the thing I remember from history was Sir Francis Drake. You know, he's on the, on the Bowling Green in Plymouth, and they say, uh, Sir Francis, the uh, Armada's on the way, and Francis says, yeah, well, they won't be here for some time. Let's finish the game. It was that sort of quality, which you don't really see much of these days. So I, I regret that going. But I don't want a cosmopolitanization of all cities. If I go to Berlin, I like it to feel vaguely German. If I go to Rome, I'd like it to feel vaguely Italian. Is, is it the shrillness of the culture? Yeah, it's the find? anger. Everyone is angry. I so I don't know what, quite what they're angry about. You know, I mean, young people are angry because they can't get into the property market in London, and I'm totally sympathetic with that. And the reason is that the extremely rich people from completely undemocratic societies and now dominate the property market in London and people, young people can't get their foot on the ladder. That's wrong. Mm. I mean, what I find really interesting about this kind of furore over the last couple of weeks is that one of the big things that drove Brexit was people's feeling that this isn't my country anymore. And I think you put your, your finger on that kind of division as well. Yes, I mean, I spoke out because I knew it would upset people. And when you've, uh, as old as I am, and you've upset people as regularly as I did, like for Life of Pride, you know that the whole thing just passes. It's just storm in a teacup. In fact, it's just a storm in an espresso cup. So was it deliberate? Yeah, sort of. Yeah. I love getting people cross when I don't think they're very smart because I can then ask them questions like, uh, when I uh, when they uh, I said that I thought that race was genetic. Now it doesn't seem to me to be an inflammatory comment. I mean, you expect people of colour to have children of colour and white people to have white children. I mean, it seems to me there's some sort of connection between genetics <laughs> and race. And then a lot of uh, geneticists write to me and say, no, there's no such thing as race. And so I think, well, hadn't you better told the race relations people? I mean, they've obviously got to come up with a new title. I, I don't know. People get excited and they don't really listen to what I say, but I make a huge difference between culture and race. I believe races are completely equal in the sense that they have all the rights that any other race has. I mean, I notice that some people 
run faster than others and others swim better than others and that's in itself interesting so we're not perhaps equal in every single way because some people are more talented here and less talented there and there's always a great thing about race about intelligence well i'm one of those people who's read howard gardner and i know that there's lots of different type of intelligence and you can be very high on one intelligence and very low on another like have you ever seen a philosopher dance well <laughs> do you see what i mean so I just feel that it, provided we're reasonably kind and friendly to each other, we can let go of these beliefs which are really largely wrong and which seem to divide people much more than they unite them. If we go back to the life of Brian, mm. religious taboos were still part of the culture. Yeah. They don't seem to be so much a part of the culture anymore, and there's, there's a new set of taboos. That's right. The new set of taboos is, 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 is quite different. I mean, now you can get away with really very bad language by the standards of the 60s and 70s. Um, but at the same time, we could make fun of the major, and he could be explaining to his girlfriend what was the difference between a wop and a dago, and we could all laugh at it. And now people take it seriously. No, that was making fun of prejudice, not, but, but people can't see that. It's like people who used to see Alf Garnet and say, well, fine, thank God these things are finally being said. I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a group of people out there who just don't get what words mean because they are strangers to irony or they're just plain ignorant or they just haven't thought about things. And it's not bad to stir them up, I think, because some of but the support, you said there was a furore, the support I've had has been extraordinary. I mean, none of my friends disagrees with me. They all say, no, it, it isn't an English city anymore. And these aren't, my friends aren't racist, but everyone says, of course. It was a very funny thing on YouTube at the moment. I don't know if you've seen this young comedian on YouTube. It's terribly funny. My daughter said it to me this morning. <laughs> but I think the nice thing is we just have a sense of humor. And what people don't understand is that teasing, which a lot of uh, national jokes, you know, jokes like, uh, oh, why do the French have so many civil wars so that they can win one now and again? You know, we can all laugh at a joke like that. People love that joke, but it doesn't mean we hate the French. So there's two types of teasing. There's nasty teasing and there's affectionate teasing. And when we're with our friends or family, we get together, we tease each other all the time. It helps us to bond. It's part of showing affection. Nasty teaching, we don't want. But don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. They're no longer around religion. Where are they? Where are the taboos in society? Well, I mean, we're now. Uh, in terms of comedy, I mean. Well, uh, yes, in terms of Tom comedy, you have to be very careful about anything to do with what is now called gender, which was, of course, was a term appropriated from grammar. Um, you have to be very careful. Sorry. You have to be very careful there uh, because people get offended. But you see, what people seem to think it's really a moral act to get offended. And I say, no, I'm offended all the time. Every time I read a news item, I'm offended, particularly if Trump is involved. You know, it all offends me. But that doesn't mean I'm going to go out and try and stop people saying and doing these things, because if that's what they want to do, I have to handle my sense of offence. And the moment you start trying to stop people being offended, then they can't control their emotion, so they have to try and control other people's behaviour. And you get the most neurotic, the most touchy, the most hypersensitive people say, this is the moral standard that we now have. You want to say, no, 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 you're the most touchy people. You, like, you're like the maiden aunts or maiden uncles. <laughs> you see what I mean? Don't try and impose that on us because this is not what we want. And what sort of people are these? You know, it reminds me of the old definition of a Scottish Presbyterian, or somebody has a nasty feeling that somebody somewhere is enjoying themselves, you know? It's that sort of mind, disapproving, it's phony a lot of it, because a lot of it's posturing, because they love this warm glow of self-righteousness when they protected, not themselves, of course, but somebody else, you know? And I think 90% of it is bullshit. PC started off as a good idea, let's not be horrible and cruel and unkind to people, and then it became this blanket thing, which it looks as though it's trying to exterminate humour and fun. What, what do you hope for your legacy? 
Uh, well, I'm not interested in leaving a legacy. I want to spend every penny I've got. <laughs> Let my children look after themselves, lazy bastards. John Cleese, thank you very much for your time. Okay. And that'll get me into trouble. <laughs>